they please. So um, I will stay here as long as people are here. So uh, if you, uh, I'm going to videotape this for about an hour because eventually it will end up on the Sandbox website so people who aren't here can participate in a way. Um, so does anyone have any objections to that? I mean, only I'm being videotaped, so no objections. You should all be on camera anyway. You're also footage. Um, but the, uh, so before we start with the conversation, though, um, I wanted to kind of introduce the idea of sandboxes first, but not spend too much time because we're here to talk about digital privacy. Uh, so uh, Glynis Sassou, who's a reference librarian and I, uh, came up with this idea of uh, sandboxes. And what they really are is an effort to promote uh, encounters with people on campus. And so um, it's this idea that there are many universal ideas that can, uh, we can all speak to. Um, we can create these interactions that are really democratic, they're really open, they're really kind of casual, um, that to promote that kind of uh, the collisions that make ideas uh, shareable. And so um, they're, uh, I don't constrain them with too much specificity, but the idea is that they're really democratic. Um, anyone can host. Uh, so this is like the first thing that we're exploring in the sandbox environment. But if anyone wants to suggest an idea, I have a link on the page where you can just kind of suggest an idea and then it can help you host. Um, and so the ideas of students, staff, faculty, people off campus, anyone who really can speak to these universal issues can host. Um, and uh, there is a, they're really, sh they're not long either. Um, they're like an hour long usually. And they're, the heavy emphasis is on conversation, so not lecture. So, you know, we explore an idea for about 10, 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to present the idea at least just to get us started. And then the rest is just gotten out through conversation. And so um, that makes it easier to host as well. So uh, for people who, you know, you don't have to prepare an hour-long talk, which I posted a workshop, my first one. And that, was, that was an experience. And so, um, yeah, so hopefully we'll have more of these. And we've also uh, built in memory, too. And so on the page, um, we have a synopsis of, uh, you know, kind of what we want to cover or anticipate covering in the event. Uh, links to related information so people can peruse that for more detail or um, if they can't attend, they can get more information from the page. Um, we have a recording too and I'm going to add time indexes too so you kind of know what to look for so you can kind of skip through um, so you don't have to listen to the whole thing. Um, and video and audio, um, either or, whichever captures the information best. And a connect section too. So if people are interested in exploring the ideas, developing projects from the ideas or whatever, we can, if they want to, we can put their name up on the website. And so if people are either at the event or can't attend, they can look for those people to maybe create something together. So, um, but this is just the first iteration. Um, I'm really open to, uh, to moving it and evolving it. So if anyone has any suggestions, please feel free to add comments. I have comment modules on all the pages. And hopefully the idea is that even if someone isn't here, they can get the entire experience. So let's get on to the experience part. I find it interesting that, you know, we're talking about digital privacy. About um, two years ago, I actually was in this very auditorium talking about our move to HillConnect. And so, um, and kind of leading people through. And so I find it really appropriate that today I come to talk about Google-related issues and really privacy at large. And so um, I wanted to start just by kind of introducing you guys, not to just privacy, but to personally identifiable in information. So what information is being collected about you? What is your digital persona online? Just as an effort to first understand what we're talking about when we refer to digital identity. There's an amazing video on um, NPR, Crow Witch Wonders site, which is fantastic. And the original story is, how much do they know about me in the cloud? And I thought this was really handy, so watch this. A simple thought. Convert it into nearly 51,000 bytes of data. The Multimedia Message, or MMS. This particular message is one of 28,000 sent every second into the World Communication Network. It accompanies categories of information like emails, ISP data, web logs, and voice data. When deciphered, these communications carry with them a pattern, or metadata, that reveal information like the user's number, who the receiver is, the location sent, the date and time of the message, the duration, the amount of data transmitted, and the subsequent cost of that transmission. The average user will have 736 pieces of this personal information collected every day. Over time, this information amounts to the user's digital identity, which is accessible any time in their service provider's retention period. 
Verizon withholds this information for 12 months. AT&T for 84. Sprint for 24. And T-Mobile for 60 months. Most individuals will have over a million pieces of information spanning the past 45 months already in their provider's possession. A third party owning nearly four years of your life. Not only do users pay for the access to information through cell phones, computers, and data plans, but those who partake in the network pay to be unknowing participants in a vast study group. If you use this network, your four years of information is extracted and sold without consent, contributing to the nearly $34,000 accumulated every second by the information sector. The specifics of nearly all digital interactions are sold to a variety of entities. Among them are ad servers that assign the individual a demographic based on their digital histories. Once assigned, individualized information is deployed to the user. Location data is filtered into intrusive localized advertising. Facebook likes transform into custom Walmart ads and search engine results are narrowed to a limited scope. The global internet becomes the personal internet and information ceases to be information at all. So, so we're talking about, I mean, one of the focuses of this conversation is on Google. I mean, as you can see, uh, each company may have different policies on the data they collect, and even what kind of data they collect. And so that's kind of, I thought, was just a useful introduction to the issues. So I don't know if you guys have any thoughts or reactions to uh, this before we kind of get into Google specifically. Yeah. So each company has a different policy, and that's one thing that makes this issue more difficult to grapple with because um, depending on the provider, so Facebook, Pinterest, Google, your ISP, your cell phone provider, they all have different policies for data retention. And you need to understand, I mean, it's just there, there's no governing principles. There are no, there are no things that, there's nothing in place to actually uh, regulate that. And so they can do what they want. It's all in the end user license agreement. I mean. It is in that 34-page document that you can read before you accept the services. It's just the issue there is that it's just not, it's not human readable, so you don't understand what you're necessarily getting into. Absolutely. So that's part of the filter bubble effect. And there is a link on the Sandbox website to a presentation by um, Eli Prisier. Um, it's uh, this one right here, Beware Online Filter Bubbles. And so, yes, you're correct. I mean, you're assigned a unique demographic, you're to a unique demographic pool. And so if you go to different sites, particularly news sites, you'll see this if you go to uh, New York Times, CNN, Fox News, Yahoo News. Uh, there are 27 or 28 different front pages just on Yahoo News that, and you'll be delivered a different one based on your demographic. There's a long history of this too. I mean, um, it was a Time Magazine. There was a, a recent story about how there were four different uh, pages, front pages for uh, Time Magazine. Americans saw one about being fat, you know, the, the implications for the obesity em epidemic, and everyone else received a front page that, that highlighted a story about the revolution, the uh, Arab Spring Revolution. And so, um, we didn't even, that wouldn't even register for us. And so that occurs in traditional formats, but online, of course, it's much easier. And so, yeah.
So bad and good are, no thanks, I'm also I wish well. Um, bad and good are social norms. I mean, those are things that we arrive at, I mean, through our laws and through you know, policies by companies. It's kind of back and forth. What, what do we want, like what does the individual want? What do we ask our representatives you know, to, to do for us when they're in office? Um, and also, how does that affect the companies? I mean, there's all this back and forth about determining what is bad and good. I mean, um, to get, I want to address one part of your, of your question first, which is um, just about um, uh, where to draw the line. It's really, the one issue with all this is that companies are, are, are remarkably open about stating their, their preference for reshaping privacy. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg, there's a quote that, you know, on online privacy is dead. I mean, that, that's all over the place. And so each company is pursuing these, their, these policies to their own end. And so they are, it's all spelled out in their license agreements, but you have to agree to them. And so, and sometimes it's obfuscated too. We talked about before the conversation that, um, you know, it's more of an opt-out system than an opt-in system, meaning that when you're on Facebook, the privacy settings are deliberately labyrinthine. It's very difficult sometimes to know exactly what is protected and what isn't, and what is public and what isn't. Um, because it's just very difficult to get to. And they make it difficult to get to because that's how they derive revenue. I mean, that information is then turned around and sold. And if you link Facebook with, for example, Pinterest or Foursquare or any other service you've heard about, Twitter, it doesn't matter, um, then if your wall is public, which by default everyone's is, the default isn't private, it is public, then that is all linked. And so all this information is aggregated. And so you have it's just a tremendous amount of data, which then can be turned around and sold. You'll also notice, too, that sometimes you'll see recommendations on the right side now on Facebook where it says, oh, when one of your friends has said, man, IHOP is great. I love the waffles at IHOP. They're delicious. It's because they posted that as a status update, and they aren't necessarily, they don't mean to advertise for the company, but Facebook is taking that and putting it on the right side and promoting it. So that way people see it as an advertisement for the company. The company gets revenue, so IHOP pays to have that position on the right side, Facebook gets some of that revenue. So that's kind of the model they're working with. And so basically the rule of thumb is if you're not paying for the service, you are the product in that case. But I want to kind of go back. That's interesting because of that aggregation thing I'm talking about. I want to go back to Google for a second. First by saying to address a certain problem, our Hill Connect environment, our version of Google Apps for Education, isn't affected by Google's new privacy policy. It doesn't apply to us. We have a separate contract with Google that explicitly spells out our policy for data collection. And so we aren't affected by this at all. There are a couple of articles on the website um, about how, in the Chronicle of Higher Education, for how this doesn't really affect us or institutions of higher education who all have very similar agreements with Google. So I just want to get that out of the way off the bat. Um, so if you have a commercial Gmail account, at gmail.com, the thing about the new privacy policy is that it permits Google to aggregate data across services. And so let's say you have a YouTube account. You have a Google Plus account, you have Calendar, you have Mail, Docs. All of that information can now be connected to form your digital identity. They talked about the metadata in the, in the video. That's now all being aggregated in one place to provide a more comprehensive picture of who you are online, which then can be used. I mean, so if you search for something on YouTube, it will know and will permit customized information to be delivered to you later. And there, this, this, there, isn't, I mean, there are negative and positive ramifications for all of that from my perspective. I mean, in a positive, the positive ramification is that it gives you services that wouldn't be available otherwise. Like if someone emails you and says, hey, come over to my house for dinner on Tuesday at 5 p.m., you can take that, click that link, and it'll automatically create an entry in your calendar and bypass that whole step for you. It can't really, it didn't work before the new privacy policy because they couldn't make that connection. The negative ramification is now they have a lot more data on you. You can't have a pseudonym, for example. You can't use an alias. This actually was an issue with Salman Rushdie. When he created a Google Plus account, they wanted him to actually use his real name, his legal name, instead of his widely known you know, Super K. And so that was a big battle, and eventually Google Cave. But you can't have a pseudonym. Um, and you have to actually opt out. There are certain things you can opt out of. And I'll take you to Google's page where they spell out how you can kind of opt out of Google's ads. And from this kind of data collection, you can opt out of, um, uh, let's see. So here you can actually see my whole life via my thvondack at gmail.com address. 
So they actually give you a lot of information here. And for certain things like um, Google search, let me see if I can find it. Uh, oh, well, so for profile, manage sharing of contact information, by, for example. And it will take you actually to that page where you can actually uh, modify your profile, your public facing profile. So there is that to understand exactly what you know, information you're sharing. But then you also have personalized ads. And because I've already signed out of it, there isn't an option for me to opt out of personalized ads on Google searches. But if you were to go to the site using your at gmail.com account, you'll actually be able to opt out of personalized ads. So it's understanding that those options are possible. And you know, one thing we can take to um, prevent from you know, our privacy from being violated outright. But anyway, that's the kind of a long answer to your question. I hope I answered it completely. They do exist, actually, and that's the thing. There's a whole ecosystem out there um, to help you navigate the waters. I mean, so there is a, um, there we go. So, and actually, most of those conversations take place on blogs and third parties that don't have any stake in, in helping you or, or defending you or not, and so, well, Well, it's actually been all over Google services before the March 1st switchover. It was actually right there on the top. Maybe logged into any of Google services. Correct. Yeah, exactly. So they, and they did take you at that link to a guide um, and said, oh, check your apps dashboard and stuff. But no, they have no stake in making it easy. But there's this service, for example, mypermissions.org, where you can actually, if you just click on Facebook, for example, and I were to log into Facebook, or I'll go to Google instead. So this link actually takes you to connected sites, apps, and services. It will show you everything I've kind of connected to my Google accounts. Um, and so that's a place to start to clear stuff out. You have Dropbox, um, uh, Instagram, and uh, Flickr and stuff. And so you can kind of see, and this actually deals more with which apps you've given permission to access these accounts. So for example, when you are on Instagram and it says, hey, publish this to Facebook. You know, you can actually, uh, you give the app permission to do that and then by clicking on a link, you're actually taking a place where you can uh, revoke that permission if you really didn't want to. Like, hey, I evaluated Dropbox two years ago and I don't need this to have access to my information anymore. I can remove permissions to do that. So there are those resources out there. It's just that it depends on like blogs, uh, people you know, your friends, uh, these kind of efforts to help people become aware of, of the the tools. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't mean to fearmonger. There are absolutely, absolutely positive ramifications to all of this. I mean, almost every site you visit on the web now, any major commercial site, depends on this personalization engine. Netflix, Amazon, Facebook. I mean, these are all using. And in terms of I mean, Facebook and Twitter, actually, that's even more personal because they're also using what your friends are saying. They're using what uh, colleagues are saying. Whomever, anyone you're connected to, to build that semantic web of knowledge. And so. But the point is it's making things you know, much more personalized. And so yes, you're, you're, you're encountering things that you wouldn't have before. 
And so that is a, absolutely a positive ramification. Right. An eclectic mix, to be sure. You tend to favor personal settings. Yeah, exactly. Tom. useful to know the sources. I mean, you actually have a tool that permits you to do the same thing on Google, for example. It's called Google Alert. And so you input keywords, and you can create pretty sophisticated logic. And so you can say, anytime someone mentions Fondac, Hamilton College, whatever, you can be pinged with a notification that someone has searched for or a new page exists with that information on it. And so that's just a consumer available you know, uh, tool. But I mean, this is the era of big data. I mean, we have the ability to collect and analyze and work through tremendous mountains of information. And so that's what we're saying with the digital identity. I mean, there are clearing houses that will actually transmit your personal identity, will we'll sell it to people who want to use it for various ends, positive and, and whatever. You have to be conscious of it. Or the merchant who has the brightly colored bowl in which you push, put fruit, and then as you wander through the market, you especially notice that bowl containing the fruit. I mean, all the psychological forces acting on us have been visible or invisible, depending on how much you're aware of those forces. There have always been gatekeepers. I, that's why I mentioned the Time Magazine example, because that, too, is an effort to kind of control the flow of information to present different forms of information to different people based on demographic or location. And so this isn't new. None of these, these things are new developments. It's just simply that the modality is different, the magnitude is different, and it always has been. You know, there is more information in society, and so the effort to shape that information, to control it, and to use it have increased throughout history. I mean, you think of oral culture, written culture, then to the internet. I mean, it's just more and more information. And so we're back to, I mean, we're still dealing with gatekeepers, but the gatekeepers are algorithmic and driven by humans who are creating these systems. To then control, collect, and then manipulate information. And so in this case, I guess, so one, and this is getting kind of more into the philosophical realm. I mean, we talked earlier about the, the filter bubble. One implication from all of this is this assignment to a demographic pool. And this gets to Lynn's point about, you know, looking up all these resources for members of the faculty and students. You know, by, you're assigned a demographic pool, and then the information you're delivered broadly, and this gets back to the recommendation engine too, broadly is delivered based on this demographic pool and it can get more personalized to like your order history or whatever. But the point is that you're led along certain avenues of inquiry. And so in Google, for example, if you search for certain information, it gives you information, this is a filter bubble effect, based on that demographic pool. And say, for example, I'm liberal, 27 years old, white male. I'm delivered information that actually reinforces that demographic to which I'm assigned. And so 
things from the National Review, more conservative sources, things that are you know, for people who may be in a different age group than I am, won't necessarily appear in the search results or I'll have to go digging. So there are all these, there, there are these things in place and they differ from service to service, but the point is that unless I'm act conscious, as you pointed out, conscious of the biases, conscious of the algorithm, conscious that the results I'm delivered may not necessarily be comprehensive, you know, or reflect the true, the true pool of information out there for any inquiry, I won't know that I'm being fed and directed in certain ways, right? Well, so, all right, so here's the limit, here are my limitations. I mean, I don't quite know the, the, all the intricacies of it. I mean, I don't, I mean, not everyone even read the Patriot Act when it was enacted, and so, I mean, that I don't, I don't, can't necessarily speak to that, but I think anything that is codified in law to protect your data still applies. And so there are companies that sell cloud services, for example, that can host data. And there are companies that actually support, you know, HIPAA data, you know, and FERPA and any of the other uh, things in place. And so. In that case, I would think that, this is just supposition, um, that the data mining would be explicitly enumerated. I mean, so they may, you know, store your account information, and they will store your data, but there is no data mining. I mean, I would think that that would be explicitly enumerated, but something to check, and I'm not quite sure, so that's all I can really contribute to that. One example is also, I mean, Google provides your ability to do this. Um, you could actually log in and check your demographic pool. And, and they actually recommended doing that when the privacy policy change was first announced. You could say, oh, click this link and you can actually see your demographic assignment. And so for me, I logged in and they actually pinpointed me exactly, you know, 25 to 30 male white. You know, for other people, it wasn't able to pinpoint them precisely. It wouldn't do well with Len, for example. Now, there's a difference whether you're logged in or not. So for example, you check your email and you log out. Theoretically, you are logged out and they can't collect that data. But the thing is, there, we, this goes back to the metadata uh, example from the video, there are so many particular things about the computer you're using that make it easy to track you even if you aren't logged in to the service. So for example, when you visit a web page, it collects information on your computer, the operating system you're running, the patches you have installed, the hardware configuration. Um, your location by IP address. There are so many things that can be used, so many different factors that actually let them pinpoint you wherever you are. And so even if you go to a library computer, for example, or, you know, and then sign in, then forget to sign out, but then go, or you use one computer for everything, that can also be used to track you in a way. And so, I mean, to get an accurate picture of everything that exists on you online, I don't know of any such resource. Um, it would sure be helpful. Um, but. Um, I'll do, I'll try and find one and see what I can do, but as far as I know, it doesn't exist. Hmm? Okay, have a look. Here we go. It's ironic. your Google account and knock that, oh, okay, that's right. So, I was just looking up the resource just because it's actually in your, so this is actually, when you go to account. Correct, so you don't even have a Google profile in the Hamilton account, so this isn't even germane, um, but if you go to, um, and because I've already opted out of it, I can't actually show you, and wanna come and log in? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> but if you can, you can actually. <laughs> Gmail.com to actually see your demographic assignments. Which is exactly why it's so difficult to get a global picture because there are so many different.
collecting this data? A marketing analyst, more likely. Huge difference, I'd say, because you can capture so much more. I mean, the, the reach is huge. I mean, because you can sift through a mountain of data very quickly and also very broadly and collect it all. Matter in what way? So, Target, here's an example. Uh, this is a, a little anecdote about Target. Um, they are really getting into big data. And so they hired several analysts to modify how data is being collected both in the store and also through their online presence. And so you walk into a Target store now, you are assigned a unique client ID, and then they track you, they know what you've purchased, they know when you purchased it, and then there are a couple of other, there are like 27 different variables they track. There's an article on the Sandbox page about this actually, it's about Target specifically, but um, they also wanted to do this online to create a uh, comprehensive profile of you. And so uh, what they did was they, they hired uh, behavioral psychologists and asked them, okay, so how does purchasing work? And so that's kind of a simple question, but a profound one. And they said, okay, there are only, it turns out there are only certain times in your life when you actually dramatically alter your shopping habits. When you move in with someone, when you get married, when you have children. Other times you're less likely to be affected by these things. And so they said, okay, let's take pregnancy, for example. How can we predict when someone is pregnant and will want to come to Target to shop for stuff? We want to be your whole shopping experience. We want you all to come here for everything you need. And they said, well, baby diapers is too late. By then, the baby's on its way, and you've already been purchasing other stuff in preparation for it. So what other indicators seem to suggest that someone is pregnant? And it turns out there are about 27 different ones. And one in particular is a cream, a cream, an actual an unscented lotion that you one rubs on their belly to deal with stretch marks and stuff. And so that is usually purchased within the first trimester of a pregnancy. And so they were able to tell if you, and there are 27 other variables as well. And so when someone either in the store or online shops and they buy that combination of products, a certain combination, there's a threshold, then Target knows to send maternity advertisements to you either by email or physically, you know, in traditional paper, you know, form. And so, there's this, they actually did this to a teenage woman. Um, they sent her an advertisement for maternity stuff. And, uh, and her father called irate and said, what are you doing? Are you trying to, to compel my daughter to become pregnant? Are you telling her maternity is a desirable state? And they're like, we're sorry, we don't know what happened. We'll fix the system, we don't know why that happened. A week later, he calls back with an apologetic tone in his voice and says, there have been developments in my household that I wasn't privy to. My apologies. I was wrong. She is actually pregnant. It predicted and outed her pregnancy before she even told her parents. That, that kind of mining, that kind of, of, of algorithmic searching is only possible in a digital environment. I mean, where you can actually compile all of that and not sift through it and mark down little columns, oh, this person bought this and bought this and bought that. That kind of manual process is very difficult to do on a human scale. On a computer scale, it's much easier. It's great. I mean, yeah, you're led to find products that you wouldn't have considered. And, but the thing is, it, is, it also uh, it has these ramifications, these side effects that you, couldn't really, you aren't really aware of until they affect you. A sentry turret.
other, exam other examples too. And there are other examples too like that, like employers asking uh, potential employees to provide their Facebook credentials so they can log into their Facebook accounts and see you know, the information about them. So what, you know, what's your sexual uh, orientation? I mean, look at pictures. Do you, are you a frequent partier? Do you smoke? Do you have little bumps or lesions elsewhere that may indicate that you have cancer? Do you have a picture of some, something, something pornographic or something on your Facebook account? I mean, that's, that's horrible. But that's, that is the ramification from all of this. Um, Actually violates the Facebook terms of service. And you can, you can disable location settings. I mean, and you can only, you can opt in. I mean, these services are miraculous in a way, what they permit. I mean, Twitter was used to organize in some way, shape, play a significant role in Arab Spring protests. I mean, uh, Occupy uh, Wall Street was actually using it to coordinate their efforts as well. And so they actually even developed their own internet in a way. They developed this, a separate internet. Where they had these briefcases that created a public area network that people connect to and communicate even separate from. There are all these approaches you can take to limit the amount of information you share, or share it only when you want to share it, participate in these services. So location service, it's amazing. Whenever I turn on my phone, and I'm in the city, and I'm like, I use Urban Spoon to find a restaurant, I enable location services, it's as if my phone comes to life. You know, and I can see everything around me in vivid detail. Augmented reality layers, where I can actually see information superimposed on you know, reality around me that significantly heightens my awareness, appreciation for what's around me. My, the, my ability to connect with colleagues, you know, anywhere. I can have a six-person video chat right now using Google Plus Hangouts. But to use it, this is the trade-off. I mean, if you aren't paying for the service, you are the problem. And so it's just, and it's remarkable too. You go around, ask anyone for their mobile device. Ask anyone for the mobile device and go into their settings. Bluetooth is probably going to be on. Wi-Fi is going to be on. Location service is probably going to be on. It's just you know, a lack of awareness. It's like not knowing what options exist for you to protect yourself and only transmit that which you want to on Facebook, on Twitter. I mean, all these services have an opt-out model, as in they default to everything is public, everything is open, everything is shared, everything is mined, unless you opt out of it. Even Google, you have to opt out of it. You know, they're not saying, okay, we're disabling everything, click this link, go here, as Linda was getting at earlier, click this link, go in here, and opt in. Let us know what kind of data you want us to collect, and we'll just collect that data. And so it's just a lack of awareness. There's another example I wanted to pull up as well. Um, this one. This is using a combination of things. My apologies for the image. But that's actually the app image. Girls around me. This is an application that doesn't violate any terms of service. And what it does is, are you guys familiar with Foursquare? Anyone isn't? Foursquare is this app that permits you to check in at certain locations. And so I'm in Clinton and I go to NOLA's. I will click, I'm here at NOLA's. And it publishes that to friends who have connected to me. Um, and so they can see where I am. And they can see kind of, I can attach a text comment to it or whatever, a picture or a video. And it's gamified so that, I can get into gamification if you want, but it's gamified in such a way that I can become a mayor of a place if I visit it regularly. I am incentivized to visit it regularly because then the merchants can turn around and give me a coupon because I'm a frequent visitor to the place. I own the place, quote unquote. This wars have started because of this. I'm not even joking, like being the mayor of a place. It's insane. But the point is, is that that is also an opt-out model. And so Foursquare also prompts you, if you have a Facebook account, to connect Foursquare to your Facebook account. And if Foursquare is public and Facebook is public, then the information is cross-posted and it's just visible. And so this developer, this is a Moscow-based developer, app developer, created this app called Girls Around Me. And what it does is it looks, it finds your location, which means that whoever uses this also has to make their location available, which is funny when you think about it. Um, it will simply show where people have checked in on Foursquare who are female around you. And it gets all their data from Foursquare or Facebook. 
if they keep, they keep their profiles public and puts them up. I don't know about that. I mean, you can, it is being reshaped, it's being, it is evolving. And the problem is who's redefining pri privacy in this context? Not the users of the services, but the service, the people who provide the services themselves. So we aren't in control of how our data is being shared. I mean, companies are doing this, governments are doing this. And so the, the landscape of privacy is being redefined from the top down, not from the bottom up. And so as, I can't speak to Eisenstein's point about the creation of, of private and public space, but you get the sense, I mean, this goes back to the point about Facebook and sharing, you know, employers potentially, you know, looking at your information on Facebook about what does private, what, what is private and public space in this environment? I mean, can people separate those two? I mean, can, what is your private life? What is your work life? I mean, we talk about this in the physical world, like, do you take your smartphone with you at the end of the day? Do you stay connected throughout the evening? I mean, you have pushed email right on your phone. You're constantly connected. And so the, the distinction between the two is often quite blurred. Volkswagen just announced a new company policy where they forbid people from checking their email after hours. So it's funny to see people reacting, in the, uh, uh, reacting to that. But yes, in terms of like an electronic space, how privacy, how the private and the public spheres are evolving, I mean, it's constantly morphing. And it's just a question of, well, who's redefining it and how do we respond to it? I mean, we can take action about all of this. I mean, thanks for coming, Peter. Um, so there are, there are actions. I mean, it just comes to, are you, are you sufficiently informed to take some action? I mean, there are bills that exist to, I mean, you heard of PIPA and SOPA, protect um, internet privacy and stop online privacy acts. Those acts in type. And those failed because those were in, I can't speak to them in any detail, but those are efforts to evolve copyright and to protect copyright, essentially, in this new digital era. And so there are now efforts to manipulate our ability to control our privacy in this, in this sphere, and for the common citizen to actually understand and then, uh, and then uh, uh, have a preference for how private their lives are online. I mean, Creative Commons, and have you heard of Creative Commons? Creative Commons is, um, maybe, do you, you wanna speak to that in any way as an introduction? Because I, I have a hard time well, so Creative Commons, what they've done for copyright, they're now trying to do for privacy. So I'll bring this up. Creative Commons. Well, so what Creative Commons has done is they've created licenses, alternative licenses, so people can, um, when they create some work and then want to publish it, governs, there are different models for how, different layers for how their, um, their output can be shared. And so instead of just saying I hold the copyright and I really can't speak to this at any length. So I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to cut it off so that way I'm not just speaking you know, and, and without any kind of support. But
so I went to ELI, Edge Cause Learning Institute. It's kind of the, the geek mecca for us instructional technologists. And um, uh, the CEO of Creative Commons spoke and actually mentioned something about privacy. And so I came up to her afterward and asked her, so, and this was in late April, so before Google's new privacy policy came into effect. And I said, okay, so I w it, could you actually speak more to what you were saying about privacy? And she said that one major initiative for Creative Commons next year is to provide kind of a similar visual, a similar way to grapple with, um, uh, with privacy and for companies to, to present to you, you know, how your digital privacy is either being protected or, or not by their services. So how, how your information is being shared. So to create this kind of, I mean, if you look at this, it's, it's very, it's human readable. And so they're going to provide a model so if companies choose, they can uh, visualize how your privacy is being protected by their services and how your information is being used. So. So like very personal information like your, your race or your location or your sexual orientation or whatever will not be shared by others. I can imagine that being one of the things that either it has a strike through or not. Like we do transmit this information or we don't. It's voluntary, but it is a step to, as an effort to kind of to tackle the issue and to help increase um, the public's ability to grapple with you know, sharing information. Completely open. And you can actually, I mean, services like Flickr, YouTube, you can actually search for content that is licensed under a certain um, creative license, creative commons license. And so you can only use open, or you can say, oh, I only want photos that people have given permission to redistribute, remix, modify, you know, but I still have to, you know, attribute it. In some case, I mean, I've had to really consciously think about this. So when I create presentations now, if I use any kind of uh, material, external material for my presentations, I actually, I, w I didn't do this before, but I now very consciously try to search for Creative Commons materials only and provide attribution. It's just something I didn't even think about, much like privacy. I mean, before really researching this, I mean, it wasn't something that was foremost in my mind. It didn't occupy a lot of my attention. Did that, did that really answer your question? Yeah.
Mm. The MiFi, yep. Mm. Same with the emergency broadcast signal. Well, and there are, Google next year will come out with Google uh, Glasses, actually, that have augmented reality built into them. And so you can actually, it will be able to overlay information um, using your glasses. And so um, the world you see around you will be augmented with data that is delivered by Google. And so all the information that you get, I mean, restaurant recommendations, you know, check-ins, or you know, whatever, uh, will all be delivered to you in this augmented reality layer. And so there is this ubiquity there. Um, and so the ubiquity has, I mean, as you point out, Catherine, there are upsides and downsides to it. I mean, um, but yeah, it's, it's that ubiquity is available to people now. I mean, we talk about banks being too big to fail. I mean, people have said the same thing about Google. Remember, like, what was life like before Google? What search engines did you guys use? Alta Vista, Dogpile. I mean, Ask Jeeves. It changed everything. And now Google is now a verb. I Google something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I in engineer. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Nice, nice. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know. And I, I, I wonder when, I mean, you know, same thing with drones, right? I mean, we're using drones uh, in our wars, and uh, NYPD is using drones to monitor citizen activities, but Citizen United is using, or um, Occupy Wall Street now has drones that they can use to spy on the police and get video on the cops committing uh, uh, the uh, offenses. And so it's, it's an arms race. And so it's not a question of when, or if the technology will become available to people, but when. And then how will we respond when that does happen? Nineteen eighty-four. Yeah, but it also there's a techno utopian vision for all of this, the singularity vision. I mean, we're heading for an age where everyone can be connected on any topic at any time. Services can be delivered that um, are really relevant to you, that guide, that help you find things, that help you um, make your life better. I mean. There, are, there is an advantage to constant connection and this kind of everything we've been talking about. There are disadvantages. I mean, well, and there are smartphones and dumb phones. So, I mean, tracking can happen with both, right, but in different ways. I mean, you have, so you have to know whether the, the devices are connected the internet, and or if they're just, you, know, you can make a phone call. But so this is also this is an interesting point to bring in about development too. I mean, in Africa, countries have foregone laying landlines. Everyone just simply has cell phones because the infrastructure is can't be built that cheaply. It makes more, more sense to go with cellular technology to avoid that expense. Same in China, um, and so there is more ubiquity there. I mean, in terms of the, of, of in the United States, in terms of cell phone usage. Is uh, by percentage of population is actually lower than a number of other nations by far, like Japan, for example, and then also Ghana, for example. Yeah. But, but you, don't, you do have to distinguish between the two. And so, you know, as in, in the video I showed you at the beginning, the be that was just the cell phone companies and, la and landline companies gathering data on you. That collection can happen even on a simple cellular telephone or even landlines. I mean, this, like I said, is nothing new. And so, there have been Orwellian forecasts about technology from the very beginning, I think, even over the 20th century. Computers, I mean, 
But there have always been Arthur C. Clarks who have come around and said, no, this is, we're heading for the dawn of a new age where you know, we, are, we can become more enlightened. And so there are two radically different visions of the future. Both are systems, both are worldviews, and people don't fit into one or the other. I mean, there are people who see oh, there, are, there are a lot of benefits from all of this, and there must be trade-offs. Companies have to make profits. We're providing these great services that people are benefiting from, but we have to make money off of this. It's a completely reasonable argument. And also, here are the other the downsides to all of this. And so, in which camp are you? And it's not just a binary. It's not this is all bad or all good. It's just simply understanding the ramifications. So, what we can do about it? Because that there there is that point to be discussed as well. You know, we talk about educating ourselves, but I actually have some information about. Thanks, Dave. All right. Huh. Pseudonyms, you don't give your exact birthday. I'll, I'll just shout some out as you're walking out the door. But So you can clear your search history. You can opt out of personalized ads. Log out from your Google account when you're, not, when you're done with checking your mail. You can change the birthday you give people. So I am now born on April 1st, 1950. Why not? It's not, it's not, I mean, I'm not, I, and I'm not speaking as a representative of ITS when I deliver these recommendations or any of this information. What I'm saying is, as an individual, these are some things you can absolutely do to cloak yourself online. I'm going to Copacabana. You can use different services, so you don't have to use Google. You can spread your stuff out. I can, you can use Bing to search. You can you know, give your maps to them. You can store your calendar elsewhere. You can store your calendar on your local computer and never trust it to anyone else. I mean, these are trade-offs. Um, you can reset your home router regularly, so it changes your IP address, you know, and so you unplug it, plug it back in. More often than not, you get a new IP address, which changes, you know, the tracking, and so they can't necessarily track you as easily. Um, oh, browser pop-up block, or browser blockers, too. This is something I really uh, was excited to show you guys. Um, there are add-ons for your browser um, that actually prevent websites from collecting data on you. Jason, I can see you shuddering right now. <laughs> so this is one called Ghostry. This is a free add-on. Um, and ITS doesn't support it, but I'm telling you about it anyway. Um, but what you do is when you install this, and I have this on my laptop, when you go to a website, there are all these cookies and trackers that are embedded in websites that gather information on you. Uh, let me see. Ah, there it is. Okay, well, that's actually very helpful. I don't still think. So it comes up with this list of all of the different little widgets embedded in websites that can actually mine your information. And I'm talking about on Facebook, the ability to mine information is profoundly interesting. Like, they can actually tell when, what you click on, how long you spend on a page, what the hotspots are on a page that you mouse over. Like, oh, hey, I'm going to check out someone's profile picture. They can actually track how long you spend doing that and where your focuses are and stuff. And it's mostly by using these little plugins here. I mean, it's built into Facebook, but on other sites it's built in. Have you, if, I don't know if you've ever seen the Facebook like button on web pages. Yeah. So you go to Facebook and it's like, oh, hey, like this page on Facebook, or click here to follow us on Facebook, or just by clicking that, that, that is one, of, one element. So you see Facebook, oh, Facebook's not on the list. But that actually is a, is a tracker that when you click on it, delivers information back to Facebook on how you interact with the site. For example, and in addition to posting it on your timeline, so people can actually, you know, see that you visited, which is itself an advertisement. The point is, is that it will take all of these. There's a database, just like antivirus software, and it will prevent those widgets from transmitting your information back to the services. So Google Analytics. I mean, and they'll also the nice thing is that if you click on them, they'll tell you exactly what they are and what kind of information they're collecting and why. Um, and so they can. You can disable them. But they, they can also be easily disabled. So, yeah. Thanks a lot for coming. Appreciate it. Look forward to another conversation about it sometime. But if you find something on um, uh, Patriot Act or any of the domains in which you work, yeah, please let me know. There are all sorts of philosophical things we didn't have a chance to get into either. So we'll talk about them another time. Yeah, no problem. Um, and so, uh, yeah, well, here's a great another example. So that's just something you can install. And so you can say block what the uh, actual widget is and what it is. So you can discover. You had your hand up earlier. Actually, I don't think I had a chance to meet you. I'm Ted, by the way. Hey.
right. It's like the billboard on the side of the highway, no connection to location or to the person looking at it. Exactly, and that was enough. Want to kind of flesh it through? So what, what do you think? Like what, how, do you, how do you feel about all this? And I agree with you completely. I guess one, so philosophically, the one reason why this troubles me is because of how that data can then be used, especially to lead people down certain avenues of inquiry. I mean, we didn't have a chance to get into this either um, earlier, but um, you know, the filter bubble is one example where you know, you're assigned a demographic and then you're given information that just reinforces your state in that demographic pool, you know, libertarian, 25 year old, whatever. But there are troubling aspects to it as well. For example, the ads in Gmail on the right that aren't you know, displayed in HillConnect. So there's actually um, a couple of people at the University of Wisconsin did this experiment. They created um, Gmail accounts with uh, certain racial names. And so stereotypically Caucasian, African American, Latino names, male and female. And they just created um, an email with one word subject lines, like car, plane, whatever. And so when they created one with car, Saved it as a draft, reopened it, so that way the ads display on the right, because they don't when you just create an email message. Um, the white, typically Caucasian names, like you know, James McAvoy, for example, like um, Aaron Storkin names, right, um, were delivered uh, ads like Audi, BMW, get a loan, blah, 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 find a lawyer. And forgive me if I'm preaching to the choir, I just, I'm just getting it out there as part of the narrative. But then, so the African American names, the Latino names, were served as like used cars, need a lawyer, as in you stole a car, get a lawyer, um, or stuff like that. And so that was the same for houses, and it directed them to things that actually reinforced their, not only their uh, racial status, but also their class. And so that, so that's one example. And then the other thing too, is on Facebook, when you change your relationship status from in a relationship to single, and you're a female, it gives you ads on the right, like, lose weight now. You know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and if you're in a relationship and you're a woman, there are ads for, uh, or you're a man, there are ads for wedding rings, for, for engagement rings and stuff. And so the point is that, especially with the changing from in a relationship to single, and that's only for, for women, not for men. And that's just as simple as an advertising company saying, hey, I want to publish an ad for this demographic. And so when you change, you become assigned to a different demographic and you're given different ads. But the point is, is that that, has that has some kind of psychological effect on us. To what degree? Debatable, and I can't speak to that. But then someone actually rented ad space on Facebook and assigned it to that demographic as well. So females who have just changed their status back to single and put affirming ones, positive ads like, you're okay as you are, you are beautiful, you are, you know, et cetera. And so that plays into it as well. And so, Anyway, that's where I'm coming from with a lot of this, like the sociological ramifications of all of this. Absolutely, we have to share it to you. Um, I'm Ted Fondak, look me up on the ITS website. Get in touch with me, we'll, we'll talk, because we can sit down. And also, reference librarians too. I mean, um, it, definitely come to the library, come to ITS. I mean, that's what I love about the, the example about checking out books. Um, I went to SU for a, a summer class, Intro to Librarianship, and essentially we talked about RFID tags and this whole issue of, okay, so can you look up pornographic material in, on the library computers? Um, is that um, and what, what are the moral issues there? I mean, do you permit people to do that or not? Um, patron data, like if it can be, the, uh, there were officers, actually there was an example of a public library in um, it was Minnesota where the officers showed up, or police officers showed up and demanded to see the, uh, the records for a patron who was um, just arrested. And they didn't have a court order and the librarians were the only thing, they crossed their arms and they were the only people between the police officers and that data. 
which then can be used to either incriminate people or not, right? Even issues like, can, I, can, can we send, like, uh, if you have an ILL book, and let's say you're in a, in a difficult marriage, and you want to get a divorce, and you're looking for resources at your local library to help you, you know, help you out, and maybe the only place you can to go, you know, say, uh, uh, you know, an ILL request is made, and they send a notification to your home and say, oh, wait, your spouse has been looking up, you know, books about divorce. You know, there are issues all over the place. There's so many ramifications even just with that example. Profit motive, yeah. I am a rational human being with time to think through these things and the resources to do that. Yeah, exactly. It's a balancing act, right? This is analogous to the political process. This is analogous to, you know, how you form communities in your neighborhoods. I mean, this is um, the world is what we make it. I mean, we talk about the political process too. It's easy to bemoan the state of government. That's fine. You can complain about it. And voting is one way to participate in that process. But there are also people who foment um, protests, you know, as a way to make their opinions known and to fight for what they want. I mean, people. Like, I don't know if you guys have heard of Jane Jacobs. She's amazing. So she's an activist who lived in New York City, especially during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And she wrote a book called The Death and Life of Great American Cities. There was an architect who was very powerful in New York City at the time called Robert Moses, who attempted to essentially remake the city uh, using his principles. There are other architects throughout history. Thanks a lot for coming, Lynn. There, are, there, there have been architects throughout history like Le Corbusier who have attempted to, they're called, and he fits in, in this group of thinkers called authoritarian high modernists who believe that you know, humans can be approved by using electricity. Like, we'll just send electricity lines out from Paris to the countryside, and by connecting these power lines, um, actually Lenin said the same thing, and by everyone using electromechanical implements, people can be liberated from the drudgery of their efforts. I'm sorry, this is a really long point, but I'm gonna get to it, but the point is that, so then, um, J Robert Moses thought by remaking New York City, he could radically improve people's lives in New York City. He was also the guy who created um, Long Island, who made Long Island possible, but he built, he designed the bridges that lead to Long Island to be kind of short. And so public buses could drive out to Long Island so the poor couldn't get out to Long Island, which is kind of an amazing thing we think about. So for Jane Jacobs, um, he actually proposed a superhighway to go through Manhattan, right through Manhattan, which would just change the face of Manhattan completely. And Jane Jacobs led the protest against and she just did it. She realized the value of communities, and she wanted to defend her local community. And what's more, she actually gathered like-minded people to protest this. No, no one compelled them to do this. No one said, this is the blueprint for what you should do to, to 
make your voice heard, your opinions heard. But it was through that kind of activism, through knowing that that's what they wanted and then doing something about it. Same thing with the sandbox thing. I just, it was an idea that we came up with. No one supported me. No one said, hey, you should do this. No one said, this is a thing you should do to get promotions or whatever. It's just simply what I wanted to create and then I just did it just because it, it was a possibility. Same with apps. I mean, that's the great thing about being an app developer these days. I have a vision for something. I can create it. The tools are now available for me to create this thing, to make it a reality. So what you, so whatever, what, like what's happening with privacy is essentially what we decide together. It's not just businesses, it's not just consumers, it's governments, right? I mean, precedent plays a role too. There's inertia in society. Everything we do is a collection of what everyone wants to make it, you know what I mean? And so right now, the push to redefine privacy as I see it is coming largely from corporations, businesses, who need to make profits. And are saying, look, this is a way to increase profits and deliver great services that consumers should use. If consumers really want, if, if privacy is such an important thing for consumers, then they'll make their voices heard. And you know what? If, if the, any change comes of that, it's probably going to be companies saying, okay, we'll put these protections in place, but we'll have to charge you for using our services. We'll have to increase the price so that way it reflects that atmosphere. It's a way for us to make profits while giving you what you want so you want to buy our products. Stuff like the Creative Commons thing, where they are going to create a model so that way companies can, may feel compelled to share how they handle your personal information. That's something that certain companies may adopt and others won't. So if Google adopts that and says, okay, we're gonna make it really easy for you to know what it means to use our services and what kind of personal information you're sharing with us, what we do with it, if people flock to the service because of that, that sends a signal to the rest of the world of business that this is a model that people really want and then the market shifts to accommodate that. And that's just how these things work. Well, there's no, there's no barrier. I can just sign up for Pinterest by clicking, I have a Facebook account, logging with my Facebook account, that connects Pinterest with Facebook. And now suddenly I have these two services and there was no barrier to it. I mean, we talk about, I want to ask you guys too, I mean, if you want to stay and talk for longer, I want to ask you guys about ubiquitous smartphone usage and the future of attention and how people are always, always bought.